Take it, Harry. Christine Devine is a lab rat, very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> she One is of too. One things was at our Alaska conference a year ago that I found out that she has a similar role in her organization as I do, and that was like quite fun to find that out. That there's other people like me. I know they know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So she's she's calling herself a lab rat, also known as an analytical chemist. However, Christine joined Toastmasters to learn to speak without emotion. I don't think that comes with being a lab rat. Oh, too much crying. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and what could be more emotional than conflict? Yeah. How many understand that? Please help me welcome distinguished Toastmaster Christine Devine. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Conflict, part of life. Pretty sad, huh? But we're humans. It's how it goes. Conflict's not always a bad thing. If you have a problem and somebody has an idea and you're willing to listen and work with each other, productivity improves, innovation happens, morale goes up, and you become the best friends. So much bonding. And that makes it nice to wake up in the morning and think, I get to go to work today, or Toastmasters. On the other hand, if there's a conflict and nobody will listen to anybody, or somebody knows everything and that's the way it is, Morale goes down, productivity goes down, negativity develops in the club, and people stop renewing their membership, and the club fails. A conflict is what you have when you have two or more people who cannot resolve the situation. And conflict resolution is what you have when people treat each other with maturity and respect and come to compromise or some kind of collaboration where there is resolution. Oops, pointing that way. There are different types of conflict. Most of them are due to difficult personalities. We're going to talk about that last. That's what the handout is for. Does anybody not have this handout? So, um, Rayanne, well, <laughs> share. <laughs> Rayanne, you're capable. Or else, I think there are some extras in the back. <laughs> Rayanne is such a sweetheart. She'll be fine. Misunderstandings. That's, that's where there shouldn't be a conflict, but I want to give you an example. I was 22 years old. I was raised in New York. We have a very dry sense of humor in the nature, in the culture I grew up in. So I'm sitting with some friends, and there's some people I don't know very well. I'm sitting down. The guy has a rolled up piece of paper, whatever it is we're talking about. He pops me on the head and he says, you turkey. <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. Even close to affectionate. Because that's what everybody's like in the place I grew up in. Then my husband and I moved to Ballard. I have new friends. I hit it off with Phyllis, two women getting together. Phyllis is telling me about the really dumb things she did and just, you know, stewing over it. And I laughed because it didn't seem that dumb to me. And I said, you turkey. It took her a month to tell me how hurt she was, how offended. And I said, you're right. <laughs> and she said, started over and told me again. No, this, this really offended her. Her feelings were hurt. And I said, really? Are you kidding me? You were offended over that? So she started again, a third time, <laughs> and told me again the problem. And now I'm catching on. She's really serious. I really hurt her. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I never meant that. I never called anybody turkey again. But that was a misunderstanding due to cultural differences. Other misunderstandings are due to the way we were raised by parents. How about different, different nations and then we get together and we, we don't have the same understandings at all. So those things matter. Oops, going back one. Doop. Kyle warned me about this. Yeah, issues. Sorry. Okay. I, have you ever used one of these rolling mics? Jeez. Issues. Issues when something is more serious. For instance, um, Perhaps team members are having a hard time. Now they're kind of stressed. I have a coworker, Dave. He's a very nice guy when he's not stressed. 
He's our computer guy. I worked for Weyerhaeuser. We were in the cellulose fibers business. Weyerhaeuser sold that business to International Paper for months. All the stuff we had to change in the computers, our logos, our health plans, our savings plans, all of that stuff. And Dave is the only guy to our department to help. So another co-worker needed help with his computer for the instruments. We work in labs. We had these precision instruments. And Dave said, you are the lowest person on my list of priorities. I don't have time for you. I haven't. And he went off, exploded, and Tom walked away. And I'm sure the relationship between Tom and Dave is never going to be good again because that's what Dave does when he's under a lot of stress. That's an issue. You need to teach that guy how to handle it better, or our boss needs to get more help. Something needs to happen, but nothing happens because our boss doesn't do people problems. And that's why we're talking to all of you today. You are going to have people problems in your clubs and work. And it's nice to know how to handle people problems. Part of the problems is styles of leadership. How many of you are baby boomers? <laughs> do you remember my way or the highway? That's the way it was done. I'm a real rule follower. I was raised in that. It fried me at work when I found out how much these professionals don't do what the company is telling them to do. I don't understand. You signed on for this. We, they pay your salary, and you're getting paid for doing their policies. Like, you choose not to do it. I don't get it. But I was raised in an authoritarian leadership thing. I think there's a hierarchy. You do what you're told. <laughs> well, oops, oops. No, let's go back. We're still, okay, we're staying on top. I thought this slide had the next one. Democratic. If you're in a situation and the leader wants everybody to just vote on what they're going to do, the reason that stinks is because if there's a popularity thing going on or a click, it's going to go with that leader rather than the one who's really in charge. It also isn't um, really considering the issues as bits of vote. I think that I think that the leader is in a better position to call it or bring in more discussion rather than voting on something. And the third type of leadership is charismatic, which worked great for Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy. Not so good with Adolf Hitler or D.C. Stevenson. Anybody not know Stevenson? He was instrumental in the 1920s bringing the Ku Klux Klan back up with a vengeance. He became one of the most powerful people in the nation. So when you have a charismatic leader, it's exciting, isn't it? You know, you're all gung-ho and, and, and hang on to that. Watch out because your heart will always lead first. So try to slow it down and think about whether this is a good plan. Because when we really want something, we will come up with reasons to justify what we want. With charisma, pay attention to where that's really going. Try to analyze it. It's hard to do. And then there's the passive leader. This is my boss. I call him the marshmallow. Not, not at work, because I don't want to be talking around at work. If you have a problem with somebody or something, you can go to his office, and he'll listen. He'll sit there, and he'll let you rant, go on and on and on. And in the beginning, it takes you a couple of years to realize he's not going to do anything. And you start to finally notice he doesn't do people problems. He's a great scientist, really knows his science, environmental methods, all that kind of stuff. But asking for help and getting the team to support you in a teamwork effort that you're doing for them, nothing. And we'll get into that more. <laughs> <laughs> but there are methods for, for um, Handling conflict. The first one is you can ignore it. I'll give you an example. We in Sound Advice meets every Thursday, once a month. No, every Thursday. Third Thursday of every month. Darn, if it doesn't rain every third Thursday of the month. And because we are an advanced club for leadership skills, our members live far. So it's important that we be close to the I-5 corridor. Well, 6.30 on a Thursday is traffic, a lot of traffic. So driving in the dark, driving in the rain, driving in the traffic. And I was really surprised when we'd have our round robin at the end of the meeting, people would complain about the rain and the traffic. The clouds won't listen to us. Can't help them there. So you let them talk and ignore it, because that one's not really on the Toastmasters agenda. <laughs> I'm pressing the wrong button. You can smooth it over. 
I, we're back to the baby boomer thing. I took all my classes in school seriously. How many times have you had somebody in your class going, I don't need to learn this, I'm never going to use this. <laughs> my attitude was different. If they're teaching us this, it must be important. I should learn it. So we had a workbook in senior high school class. And we were assigned to finish that entire workbook. It's like 44 pages of small print grammar exercises over Christmas break. It took me, I thought I'm going to finish this so I can have the rest of my break. Full three days to finish that workbook. But I really learned it. I assumed, naively, you all did too. <laughs> and so then I'm the grammarian in Toastmasters and I'm like the Gestapo grammarian. And I'm going to fix everybody's grammar because what, don't you remember learning that? No, they never learned that. They didn't care. But they've been speaking all this time and understood all of this time without my helping them with their grammar. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, in that situation, the president might want to say to me, you know, just help a little bit. Just, it really, the grammarian role is in Toastmasters to teach us listening skills, and so you're losing the point of a grammarian. So tone it down, be friendly, let it go, and in that way you're going to smooth it over. Occasionally, though, there isn't time. Say you're, in, you're pulling together this TLI, and last night the power went out here, and Lori has to come up with another location, or two nights ago, whatever. And now she pulls her team together and says, what do you think? And they're going, well, I like this one, well, I like this one. Now, forget that. Lori should just say, we're moving to come up with another location. That's force, because there's an emergency. Just do it and get it done. There isn't time for all of this teamwork. I, I think back to the pilgrims when they got off the Mayflower and they needed, they needed some kind of leadership. And I don't remember his name. I think it was John Smith. He was only 22 or 23, and he said, we're doing it my way, and he had to march out to where they were clearing trees and march back, and they told them what to eat. There was no constitution, there was no law, there was no, there was just do what you're told, because we're going to starve if you don't. And I think of that every time I think of forced leadership. Or you can compromise, but if you compromise, somebody's losing some, and somebody's winning some. So there's, they're both winning, they're both losing some but somebody's going to be seething and it's going to come up later. Better to have collaboration with the people who have a problem learn to work together and then they both win and then that won't blow up on you later. I gave you this handout because I want to talk about handling situations from this point of view and I'm going to keep bringing back my friend Phyllis who I said, really? Of that? Come on! But I, this was a discussion at the Sound Advice Advance Club. Mary Morrison, our Region 1 Director, an International Toastmasters Director. You know, when I started at TLI Officers Training, I was new, and so I didn't know who the trio were. Mike Marion is our District Director, and Kyle's our Program Quality Director. I didn't know how big Toastmasters International is. We have 14 regions around the world. And so Mary is our Region 1 director on the board of directors of Toastmasters International, and she's local to us. How cool is that? But she had give, facilitated this discussion in a sound advice club, and it was very helpful. Lori? Your slide advanced one. I did. I just got to see my hand, and I'm putting it Okay. I have to learn how to do with this. Just roll it back. Okay, great. So this is an iterative process when you're handling difficult people. So I'm talking to Phyllis and I say, you turkey, <laughs> what was my intention? Nobody knows but me. Actually, I would say I had no intention at all. It was just part of my language. There wasn't anything there. But the person that I, the, the actions that I did was public. If there were other people there and I called you turkey, I did that in front of everybody. Words, voice tone, body language. Somebody told me at the last TLI that 7% of what we do that's offensive are words, only 7%. And tone, and body, voice tone, I think it was 66%, and, and body language was 30 something. But what hurts us the most are words. 
And yet, so that's what we remember. Even if I psh, blow you off, make a face, come on. You, you don't see that as much as if I say to you, <laughs> what a turkey you are. That people hold on to. So really be careful with your words. Because the person who I offended has an impact on her. And it's private. She took a month to get back to me to tell me her private feelings on what I had said. So I'm the person on the right. And Phyllis is the, oh, no, okay, this is house right. I'm the person on your left. <laughs> and, and Phyllis is the person on your right. Or you're the person on your right. So the first step when you're hurt and offended, what was your trigger? What was it that made you so hurt or so enraged? And then think about that. Is it reasonable? Are you being reasonable? Did it, was it a trigger because of your childhood? Is it a trigger because there's a culture difference? But what is the reason that you're so offended? Because you first have to figure out what the deal is with you because if you're the one who's impacted, it's your responsibility to talk to the person who offended you. And that's a scary thing. I don't know if Phyllis had said that, had offended me. I doubt I would have said anything. I would have let it blow off. But I still remember it. <laughs> so now you're going to try to talk to the person who's hurt your feelings. And you say, um, you know, you always do this. You want it. You, you, and you start accusing. Now, if you look under the DESC part, the first thing you do is think about the behavior, looking through a camera, and don't bring up past problems, just this issue, and then talk about how that impacted you. And Phyllis was explaining that her feelings were hurt. I wish I could remember it better, but I was 22. What I remember is, is my reaction to her when she tried to tell me her feelings were hurt and how I was clueless, so clueless. And specify the behavior and give concrete reasons why you found that offensive. And your concrete reasons could be, you know, I wasn't raised by a baby boomer or, or authoritarian leadership. I don't like the way you talk to me. It's wrong and culture has changed and I think you should move in with the times. You know, okay, we got married in 77 and in 74, and all of that time I've been saying to my husband, because the women's movement was on, right, Jim, you need to drag yourself into the 20th century. And then it was, it was like 1998, 99, Jimmy, you're missing the whole 20th century, and finally, 2000, forget it. You missed the whole thing. This is the 21st century, and he still wants to go back to the 50s. But... So I have to blow him off in his attitude and be in this century. But how to do this, I want that now I'm moving. I really kind of revamped Toastmasters CAM presentation. Kyle put that slide in for me so that you could see what I was saying. You find the root cause. The root cause would be what triggers you and, and what the other person's intention were. You need to know what that offender's private intention was ask. I bet they don't know. Oops, too fast. Okay, one more. It's not working. Kyle? <laughs> no. This is it. Okay. The best CEOs listen. So, if a CEO comes into the boardroom and there's a problem, and he comes in and he says, okay, here's the problem, and this is what I think about it, but now I want to also know what you all think about it. Let's go around the room. Every single person at that table is going to say the same thing the CEO said. So, the CEO should come in and say, here's the problem, and explain it. And say, I'd like to know what you think we should do. And go around and listen. But what if, when the CEO gets to this person, and the person says what he thinks, and the CEO goes, For the rest of the table, nobody is going to agree with that person. Keep your poker face on, hard to do, so that you can listen to everybody. Because even if 
somebody over here says something kind of dumb or just impractical. As it's going around, somebody else might be able to leap off of that idea and say, you know, what he was saying could work out if we also did this. So you need to keep your face, poker face. How good are you at playing cards? <laughs> I stink at it. Um, and then, oh wait, so wait, where's it going? Keep your poker face on. Oh, everything, 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 everything that somebody says is on the table, is acceptable, and write down everything. Because eventually you'll be able to <coughs> funnel it down to what's best, or pull things um, where you, you glean specific things together to get to that point. Also in that, you need to discuss how is this conflict affecting your team, your club members? If there's too much negativity, people won't renew. They're going to leave. The club is going to fail. All right, try this again. This is what I was saying about the CEO. Don't, don't let emotions take over. Well, so the CEO should have a poker face, but in the frustration of ideas as they go around the room and people get upset and start to argue across the table. It's called crosstalk, right? This, the president, say, is the leading this discussion and somebody starts <laughs> arguing with somebody over there, stop them. This does not allow in a court of law. One person is speaking at a time. Hold that thought, write it down, or you can put up an easel and you call it the parking lot. And if something comes up that is not germane to this issue, Write it down there, we'll get to it later. It's waiting off in the parking lot. Kind of like when you go to the airport to pick up somebody off the plane and you're sitting in the parking lot waiting for your plane to come in. Also discuss what is preventing the team from achieving its goals. What's blocking things? Oops. Okay. Oh. Well, while you're discussing what's keeping people from achieving their goals, and we're talking about frustration, that's when you need empathy, you need respect. The first slide talked about maturity and respect. And then that's the part about arguing, crosstalk. Don't blame people, don't accuse anybody. Give everybody the benefit of the doubt. I heard Phyllis's feelings. I meant nothing. So find out where this was going and encourage everybody to listen. And then I ask, what's the first leadership skill Toastmasters teaches in the Competent Leader Manual? And it's listening. And um, it is listening. Sorry? So, I oh, thought you answered. Okay. You have to identify the areas of disagreement. It's more than just having difficult people. Sometimes the, the problem is you can't even be heard. Let's say you have a know-it-all in your club who just, just thinks he should talk first all the time because he knows everything and nobody else should have to say much because he can do it. That's in here on this, on this sheet. Um, then there's also, if you give an experience, rather than giving the experience, <laughs> I talked at work about we were cleaning out drawers and the, couldn't open the drawer all the way and I had my hands in the drawers dragging everything forward so I could clean out that drawer and there were razor blades in there and an open X-Acto knife. So at the next meeting, I opened that up. I said what I just said to you and the reminder was to wear gloves. And somebody said to me, well, where did that happen? <laughs> Wait, does, does it matter? It's a reminder to wear gloves. So areas of disagreement, if somebody disagrees about something, should you start launching off on your story that you had a bigger, worse area of disagreement? Not germane to this discussion. Don't get so sidetracked. Keep bringing it back to where you are. <sighs> Bullies are the worst. How many of you ever had to deal with a bully? Wow, a lot of you. And the other one, nobody. I did twice. Once in my church and once at work. In my church, it was child abuse. And I 
was too scared to call Children's Protective Services myself. I don't know what my, I don't think I was thinking. I called the middle school and asked to speak to the boy's guidance counselor and talk to him. And he said he would call CPS. Was it all right if he used my name? I could stay confidential if I wanted to. I, pff, I've been talking to this boy's mother all this time. They're going to know where this came from. But here's the thing that really, really surprised me. Out of all the people in our church who was aware of this situation, only one person stood by me. It was not my husband. At work, the bully was a team manager in a large lab. <clears throat> she had a lot of people working for her. She was not kind to any of them. There were only two people that she liked, and they were the only ones who worked hard. She was convinced that she worked harder than anybody else, and these two people that she was friends with or she really relied on. So her lab was a revolving door as people came in and found they couldn't work for her and one kind of migrated to some other lab or quit. But this particular time, a man came in to work, new employee, and she would insist that men cannot multitask which was funny to me because the male boss I had is the best multitasker I'd ever had. He was just really cool. But I was in the lab and I saw it. She doesn't believe in gloves. So he's holding a glass cylinder and he's pouring a caustic solution, which is an acid or a base will burn his skin. And she's down here screaming at him, where is the bottle? The bottle that I put here. Like, who cares? And so now he's doing this. And trying <laughs> So I talked to her because I was the chem quality control officer and I was also the chemical hygiene officer, which means chemical safety. But every time I would talk to her, she'd go rushing into my boss's office, ranting in there. But I know the marshmallow boss isn't going to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I tried talking to her three separate times and she blindsided the marshmallow every time. So I, this is nuts. She won't even listen to me. I can't say anything to her. I asked her to talk with me. She, she, I don't have time. So I wrote a letter addressing the issues that had come up. In my last paragraph, I naively wrote, if this ever goes to court, I'm going to take a stand against our company because company policies weren't followed. But because I know when I send her this letter, she's going to blindside the marshmallow again, I send it to him first. And I tell him, I'm going to send this to her at noon, but I wanted you to know what's going on. And he wrote back, you can't send that to her. I sent it to Human Resources and the Chief Technology Officer. I looked up bullying after that and researched, what do you do when you have a bully? Because that's just new for me. And it said, the, the advice was, you invoke the boss, the board, and the law. Well, I, I did, she was invoking the boss. Nothing. I unknowingly invoked the board by sending the, that letter and having it sent to human resources. And if it had gone to court, that would have been the law. In Toastmasters, you have a bully in your club. You talk to your president. I would guess that your club president is the boss. If you read the club leadership handbook, it pretty much says the president is supposed to handle these things in the club. But we're, we're volunteers. We're in Toastmasters to learn how to do these things. And if your president isn't up to it, I fully understand not being up to it. It took me a long time to help that boy that was being tortured in our congregation. And then to find out how many people knew and nobody was stepping up. We're not really up to that much of a fight. We're not warriors. So if the president feels he, she cannot handle it, I would guess the board is Mike Marion. He's our district director. Or actually, Toastmasters International is wonderful. You can just call them and ask for help and say what the situation is. And that would be the board. And Toastmasters International does have a legal team to handle the legal parts of having a bully in your club. Mike? No, I'm mad as help. As district leaders, we've been informed that we should not be uh, trying to solve those kind of problems in the world. District leaders are part of Toastmasters International, and as she just said, they have a legal system. If it comes down to anything like that, when you contact, you should contact your area director. But eventually, if we can't solve it amiably, it will go to the legal team at Toastmasters. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. So I guess we're done with bullying. Let's see. So yeah, we talked about people, all these ideas written down and pulled together and you divine areas of agreement. You search for solutions. Oh, I know, it was a past district governor who said, if you have that much trouble with a particular person in your club, that's why we vote them in, so we can vote them out. And that's what you do. Otherwise, the negativity in your club gets so deep that people won't renew their membership and the whole club is going to go out. Because of one person? Get, lose that person. We can always vote them out. Yeah, I know. You don't have to vote them in to be able to vote them out. I should check into that. And reach a consensus. That's part of the collaboration part. If you could reach a consensus on how to handle this, then you're all in it together and that's, that helps with bonding. Oh, so I did, I did, you know, I have my notes here because my mind races and I get ahead of myself. <laughs> we talked about writing all the ideas down. And then you evaluate the positive and negative aspects and, and pull the best from each of them. And then keep narrowing it down. That's, they call that funneling. I took training at work. So you, why did you do that? And so you give an answer to why you did it. But then why did you do that? and keep going down and down and down until you get to the really bottom and it takes work and it is a lot of work so deep breath some coffee sit down only talk one at a time so you don't get so frustrated my kids tell me I'm angry I'm not angry I'm frustrated well you look angry oh, Jesus, God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know um, the leader must resolve conflict, otherwise this is going to tank. So I want to see if, um, yeah, more questions might be, um, what would it take to get this, this idea ready? Say you come up with an idea then that you could use to handle this conflict, then you're going to have to write out a game plan of what it takes to get this ready. Um, what could happen that might block it? Look for scenarios or things that might go wrong. And then ask questions the whole way through so that you're not telling people what to do. I always want to jump the gun. I want this fixed. I want it done yesterday. I have to hold my breath and wait and just take a breath and keep telling myself I'm supposed to be working on listening, two ears, one mouth, shut up. And then don't qualify anything that's said when you're going around the table. Just listen and have it written down. Critique the ideas, not the person. Because some of you might already have a problem with some of the people in the club, and so try to hang on to that. That's the heart getting in there first. The past feelings and passions and irritations and all that stuff. You have to try to stick with your mind and not the heart. You know that saying? The heart wants what the heart wants. You can tell somebody this marriage isn't going to work. Don't marry that guy. I knew my daughter's marriage wouldn't work. I never told her not to marry him because she would have said the whole time, you never wanted me to marry him anyway. Mm -hmm. And the marriage didn't work. Thirteen years later, they're separated. The heart wants what the heart wants. You can explain things until you turn purple. If you're passionate about something, you're going with your passion. It says, I read a book called um, How to Deal with the Righteous Mind. The way we have Christians, Jews, Muslims, and you know how they polarize people. And the author is saying it's like riding an elephant. The elephant is the heart that you want. You're trying to ride this elephant, but your mind knows, well, you should go this way, and you're trying to turn in. But you're going to go with the, the heart, and it's it's a hard thing. Um, I feel like I've been talking forever. I'm watching <laughs> the timer. But wait, I do have more. So, oh, and limit distractions. No mobile phones. So get all the Kindles and everything out of the room. Turn them off. Don't even have them on vibrate. Turn them off. Because somebody is saying something that's very important to them and they look over at you and you're because you under the table. The other thing I want to say is Oh, I don't, let's see. Is the May 2017 Toastmaster magazine 
was a lot about conflict. And so I have them in here somewhere. I guess not anymore. I brought some articles with me. All right, later. They must be in the back. One is on dealing with difficult people, and another one is on handling these difficult situations, if you want to look at them again. May 2017, Toastmasters. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have any feelings or ideas on the difficult personalities here? And you like that it leaves you one that you can write down your own trigger if this didn't cover it? George? What do you do with the impossible person who won't listen to any of you in the club and just drags you down farther? And the reason I share that, because I want to share with everybody, I'm part of a club, we had 24 members. I left that club because we couldn't control the person, we got down to six members. Finally, we talked to the trio, and then we called the lawyer at Toastmasters International and, and took care of it. But we went a year and we lost all those members. <coughs> That's what I would say is a bully. He's not, he's not a violent or abusive bully unless he just gets angry if you won't listen. But somebody has to step up and say, we're talking, and make him stop. The other thing in the magazine, the Toastmaster magazine, said if that person just keeps talking all the time, put him in charge of writing the ideas down on the easel. <laughs> so now he's doing this, and then he, you know, he won't be bothering you. It was Fine. No, sorry. Okay, ancient grammar in English. We default to the male. I know. Since then, interesting. It was like a hundred-pound female, very small, petite person with a great big uh, issue. We couldn't do anything right. <laughs> expectations, etc. So it can happen. Any kind of person can become that problem in your club. That takes in number two. Number three, the blamer and shamer, and number two is the talker, monopolizes the conversation, and then there's the bully, uses physical presence or position of power to pick on others. Then there's one who's negative and is always criticizing your ideas. Yeah, see? Okay, so that tells you we've got a bully in your midst. And those, those are the ones that suck the enthusiasm out of things. This is, this is the reason this paper is so valuable to me. And I hope you can take the time to look at it. I think maybe the diagram is a little hard to understand, which is why I wanted it up there so I could show you what I'm talking about. So um, we talked about misunderstandings, which are usually cultural or, or just you didn't even know you did anything. And the issues, because there is a difficulty with one person or, or somebody's too stressed, those kinds of things. And we talked about styles of leadership. I don't know which is worth the authoritarian one or the marshmallow. <coughs> I'll tell you though, I, um, after working all those years in marshmallow, I know I'm getting no help. I have become a steamroller because I, I can't get in. And if I'm going to have to do this by myself, and you guys on paper are supposed to help me, and it's part of your salary, and that is what I said in that meeting when uh, it went on for nine months, and now I tell her, I want them to do it here. We have Monday morning meetings, and so somebody says, can we just have homework? You've had homework for nine months. You signed a paper when you t signed on here, and it listed your duties and how much you'd be compensated for it, and nowhere did it say that you'll be compensated even if you don't want to do it. <laughs> and everybody just sat there like this. <laughs> I was really surprised at the end of it, my admin, who's the sweetest woman in the world, comes back, slams her papers down, I've never seen her do anything emphatic, and says, I am so angry at you for saying that. And I'm thinking, you're angry. I didn't answer her. I love her. She's a sweetheart. She's, I, you're angry? Nine months. I'll tell you about it. <laughs> that was an issue we had in. <laughs> yeah. So I had, now I had to learn how to turn down the steamroller. Yes. Um, I'd give another perspective on passive leadership because they're not always marshmallows. Some of them are just facilitators. And what that does is it does allow other people to step forward and develop their own internal leadership. So, it's, it, you know, I think for those of us who have authoritarian parents and all, don't recognize the strength in somebody who's a facilitator as a passive leader. I, my first boss, I was blessed with a facilitator and there was nothing passive about him. For those people who worked well on the team and came up with their own ideas and were innovative, he was very supportive. 
But he also swung through all the labs in the morning and would say to each person, what do you have going this morning? Do you need any help with anything? He wasn't a marshmallow. And if there was somebody who wasn't doing what they needed to do and other team members were suffering from it, he'd keep meeting with that person. He was very tenacious. He never lost his temper. He kept his poker face and everybody went worked smoothly together, but more than that, I felt really safe. And I thought, eh, that's probably a female thing. And I talked to a male coworker, and he said, no, I always really feel safe working for Rick, too. And that's the point. Kyle, sorry, I thought you were pointing to something. No, no, I have a question. Mm. Any advice on dealing with a passive-aggressive person? Because we have a person in my club who's friendly to your face and then backstabs you whenever you're not around. It's on the list. Yeah, that person's on the list. I'll say that person then is a bully, a passive aggressive person. I think the, the president has to keep talking to him about it. Um, I would go back then to those articles. I wish I remembered to pull it out. I thought I did. And it talks about how to handle those people. Let me see. Speaking to them privately. Mary, do you know how you handle passive aggressive person? It was. I have a Great, thank you, because I don't know. Generally, a passive-aggressive person that talks behind your back is not saying nice things about you, but your club members know who you are. So in general, they're doing you a favor. They make you look good, and they make themselves look bad. This is true. So you can take a breath and say, huh, not the way I'd like to act. You have to have strength of character to be able to do that. People who are already... <laughs> ah, yeah, I know. People join Toastmasters because they're scared. I joined Toastmasters because I couldn't speak without crying. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, um, it was suggested to me one time, like, when you, with difficult people, is to try to build a relationship with them. And now I'm not saying that that always works. Because uh, I've tried it, sometimes it didn't work. But sometimes it does work, and then when you build a relationship with them, sometimes you find out there's the kind of misunderstandings. So, you know, that's just another approach you can you can try. Yes. In general, my experience has been that most of these personality types come up because people don't feel like they're being hurt, that they don't feel like they have the power that they need in order to you know, defend themselves or work for themselves or whatever. And I don't, I don't think there's like a one size fits all. But no. And I've honestly had some passive aggressive behavior in the past myself just because I don't feel power, you know, empowered. Empowered. Mm -hmm. Empowered to do what I need to do. And, you know, when you empower your, your people, your community, and I, that's like an ideal situation, but that's what we're trying to move towards. Mm -hmm. So I want to rephrase in case you didn't hear him in the back. He's saying that most people who, who be passive aggressive are that way because they don't feel they're being heard. So then they're frustrated and then they turn into the steamroller and they're going to be heard. And so he's saying we need to listen to each other more and, and find something in common and work this out. George? I want to share with you, it's not close <coughs> matches, but a different group I'm in. We have a very passive aggressive person that's been that way for a couple of years. And the board finally voted to say, we're going to give this person an official letter after we had talked to him, etc. says, your behavior is no longer acceptable in our group. And if you do not discontinue your behavior, you're going to be removed from our group. That finally got that person's attention. Yeah. And that um, was yes? I was wondering what it means when you say stabbing uh, me in the back. Uh, in this case, in this case, the person is uh, friendly and supportive whenever we're in the group environment, and um, <clears throat> one of her emails blaming me for members who left the club accidentally made it back to me. She mm -hmm. said she sent it to somebody else, and it finally secured us wrote back to me. Mm -hmm. And these were people who left the club for many reasons, had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. But I was just wondering how this person must feel that others are receptive to her negative talk. So it would be Possibly. an issue of the other people pushing back. <coughs> and yes, in the back? And I think that sometimes, to the extent that when I've dealt with people like that, there is a level of cowardice um, to that person. And I think that if you confront that person head on and what I've done in the past and say, you know, I'm very sorry, 
She's saying that so you, she's the person is nice to you in the meeting and then backstabs you outside of the meeting and you go back to that person and said, I thought our conversation went well, but I heard that you said such and such to so and so and and so now I'm wondering, did we understand our conversation correctly? And call that person on the backstabbing. I've tried that too, that works very well. <laughs> Ran? Short? Short? For me in a work situation when a person was behind leadership's back, giving them a job and making them responsible for something, all of a sudden all the gossiping behind leadership's back stopped. Yeah, that's, that was also recommended in the Toastmaster magazine, give that person something to do. I couldn't remember the other thing and that was it. In, way in the back? Yes, I just wanted to make a comment. We had something occur in our club that was a conflict, make sure you have a preferred method of communication when something like this is handled. Our secretary sent the minutes out with a lot of inflammatory information, and I said to her, why didn't you bring this to the board first? And I know when you ask why, you put someone on the defense, but this is a work environment, a college. And I informed her, do you know you could actually have me fired? I founded this club. How are they going to perceive what's happening in this club? My point of bringing it up is, as a board, make sure you have a preferred method of communication before something is put in minutes. And really, Robert's Rules of Order says, minutes are about what happened, not about what was said. Right, right, that's exactly right. Sorry. Something that I think was uh, vital to all of us being here that we are volunteers, we, we, we chose to participate. Therefore, my rule of thumb for dealing with this situation is that nothing is personal. Nothing is personal? Can you repeat? In the sense that not, nothing that happens here is personal, right? In the sense that I'm here because I want to be here, and you're here because you want to be here. I shouldn't take anything that you say to me personally because you don't you might not know me very well. Mm -hmm. right. That rule of thumb helps me deal with some of the right. negative stuff. With all humans it's gonna happen. He's saying that in the club meetings we may not know may not know each other very well, so if something is said, don't take it personally. We're here to Toastmasters to learn for the goals of Toastmasters, not not to start picking at each other. I'm watching my time. I thought I saw a hand over here. Yes? Um, in my perspective, there are two ways to look at people. You can look at them as being broken and need to be fixed and controlled. <laughs> <laughs> broken and need to be fixed and controlled. Which is like where a lot of this you know, kind of um, strategy comes in. Or you can look at them as whole and need to be you know, empowered and healed. You know, the way that you look at which choice you choose to, to take, which perspective you choose to take, impacts everything. Yes. <coughs> but that's a learned life skill. Oh, it is. And, oh, yeah. and it's not easy. Toastmasters has changed me a lot because. It takes on average five years to change your personality. How many of you took uh, more than a year to stop smoking or something like that? It, it's hard to change your personality. It's really hard for me to stop talking and listen. <laughs> <It's over. laughs> ah, yeah, I would just keep going because I'm trying to make a point. So I don't see any more questions. I'm sorry, good. I'd just like to make a comment. I think one of the things that's I think one of the things that's really important for us to remember as a, a personal development course attendee is that <coughs> everybody's in process. Yes. And because they're yes. in process, sometimes our expectations are much higher 
for someone who appears, their visual appearance gives you the impression they've got things under control, when in fact, internally, they're really struggling. And that's why they're there. They're trying to learn how to communicate. So invariably, what happens is if someone doesn't call that situation, nobody knows that it wasn't a case of personality problem. It was a case of uh, lack of training. And that's the whole point of this program. Right, right. Excellent. That is true. I went through my Toastmasters journey with my heart in my throat. But I have a mentor here who says, why don't you try being an area director? <sighs> okay. <laughs> so, I did that two terms because I, that first term, not so good because it, it's hard for me to step up to this. Danny. Christine, in our club, we had a problem with one of the members just violently leaving the, the meeting room. We could have taken the approach and have them thrown out. But the other thing what we did is opened up a communication with the person and found out they were actually thinking about taking their own life. So by intervening and opening up communication, we stopped that. Right. It has a good point. I um, mean, my life was tanking. At, at my behavior at work was sometimes bizarre, and I fully understand. I want to thank everybody for all your participation. I hope that this helps. Maybe laminate your copy and keep it with you always. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Let's give Christine and, and Mark both a round of applause. Thanks. Oh, that's so tired. Thank you.